There's a lot of stuff there. There's a lot to unpack. John actually, John the Baptist in this text, is contributing quite a bit theologically to the whole book of John. And actually, we're going to see that this morning. We're going to see that as John, the author of the gospel, this is going to be a challenge, okay? You're going to have to pay attention, because sometimes I'm going to say John, and I mean the disciple of Jesus loved, the John the Apostle, and sometimes I'm going to say John, and it's going to be John the Baptist, and if you're not paying attention, you won't... If I'm having enough trouble speaking and following along, you listening are going to have to follow along. So, John the Apostle, who's writing the gospel for us, puts in the context of John's speech to his disciples, or those who have come to question him, John the Baptist gives us some very, very important information about who Jesus is. John the Apostle allows John the Baptizer to speak with clarity and some significant importance, something of real importance about who Jesus is. And so we need to hear that this morning. As we turn to the book of John, one of the things that John the Apostle, who's writing this book, wants us to understand is that Jesus is at the center of everything God is doing throughout all of history. Everything leading up to Jesus has been pointing to him and preparing us for him. That's actually what we saw John say here, right? Is that I was coming before the Christ. I was getting ready for him. And now that he's here, I'm through the roof. I'm excited. I'm ecstatic. My joy is complete. It's full because he's here. And Jesus now becomes the hinge point, the, the, the focal point as we move away from the New Testament, as we move out into the church ages, we move into the book of Acts and all the epistles of, of, of John and Peter and Paul and others, we see that now we are looking back to what Christ has done as a way of understanding what he is about to do. And John, as he writes his gospel, wants us to get that. So let's go through what John says. Let's go through this story and hear what is happening and also hear what John says in response to what's happening. It begins by saying that Jesus, who has just had a long conversation with a man called Nicodemus. We're going to touch on that again in a second. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them baptizing. Now, we're going to learn later on that Jesus actually isn't doing the baptizing. It's actually his disciples who are baptizing. John also was baptizing in this other location. There's plenty of water and people are still coming to him to be baptized. So the ministry of John has not ended. Jesus is on the scene. Now we're going to see, if you read the other Gospels, what we understand is Jesus is still pretty low-key. It's not until John gets put into prison that we actually, actually see Jesus begin to uh, sort of step into the fullness of his ministry. We see that once John is put in prison, Jesus now steps out and begins to preach this repentance because uh, the, the kingdom of God has drawn near. The kingdom of God is at hand. And so Jesus hasn't quite fully stepped into that fullness of his ministry. And it, for those of you who know uh, the story sort of of the New Testament, we're going to see Jesus stepping up and sort of as John recedes, Jesus comes forward. And that's exactly what's happening here. It says that this is before John was put into prison. And some of the Jews notice what's going on, this dynamic that's going on. They see that Jesus is gaining in popularity, and that means John necessarily is losing some of those who would have been coming to him. They say in verse 26, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one that te you testified about, look, he is baptizing, and everyone is going to him. <coughs> You'll notice there's a bit of a conflict, it seems. You have two teachers, two rabbis, who are now preaching side by side, and it's almost like we have uh, a battle for attention. At least that's what it looks like from the outside, doesn't it? That's what these people are concerned about. John, don't you realize you're losing your market share to this other guy who's now preaching, this other teacher? Aren't you a little concerned about that? Imagine if you want a small town and you've got two bait and tackle shops across the road from one another, right? Fishermen don't need to attend to go to both shops, do they? So who gets the business? Well, I would advertise my leeches are the freshest. They're the biggest, the juiciest fish love my leeches. 
Ah, but you see on the other side of the road, we have this exclusive contract with a company that produces only the highest quality rods and reels. You need to, do you see how the battle begins? We each try to promote our own product, to promote our own brand, so that they come to us instead of the other guy. I think it's in Port um, in on your way down to, um, to Perry Sound. There's a small town, and there's like a fish and chips shop on either side of the highway. And they both make claims. I, 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 just, I, I wonder how that dynamic goes, right? You live in the same small town, and you, and you offer the same product. If one succeeds, the other's going to be diminished, aren't they? And I think, humanly speaking, if the people came to me and said the things that they said to John, my response would be concern. I think even on the best days, preachers and folks who lead churches, when they see other churches succeeding, there's at least a part of us, and we know it's not right, we look at the success of that church and we are envious of that. What are they doing that I'm not? And sometimes we feel like it must be, it must be some sort of trick. They must have a hook. They must have something they're offering, some underhanded scheme that's getting everyone to go there instead of coming here. That's ugly. And I hate myself when I feel like that. Like, that's a part of me that I just resent so much. I want it gone. Because you know what I should be saying? Praise God the gospel is being preached. Praise God somewhere, even if it's not here, Jesus is being lifted up and people are hearing that good news and they're finding life somewhere. I'll keep preaching the good news, but if they don't come here, praise God they're going somewhere. Praise God they're finding the truth of God in a community that surrounds them and loves them and builds them up. Because what matters is not my popularity, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's where John is, right? We hear Paul say a similar thing. I don't care if they're preaching out of envy. I don't care if they're preaching because they're afraid that now that I'm in jail, that somehow the gospel... I don't care the reason. All I care about is the fact that Christ is preached. And John, when he's approached with this concern, says, Listen, I told you... I am not the one you've been waiting for. I told you, I'm just getting you ready to receive the one you're waiting for. That was my job. That's the, that's the ministry God gave me. And so as he, the one you've been waiting for, arrives, that means I need to step into the background and allow him to be what God is calling him to be, what God has sent him to be. We hear that very often this word quoted by John, he must become greater, I must become less. Notice John replies directly to their question, a person can receive only what is given from heaven. This is critical. John sees a distinction between his ministry and Jesus' ministry. John actually sees a distinction between who he is and who Jesus is. It's not just he's a better preacher. It's not just, you know, he has more charisma. It's not even just that he has a better message. It's that he himself is the one we need. Listen to what he says. You yourself can testify that, I'm, that I said I'm not the Messiah. I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become more and I must become less. See, it's not just that John thought Jesus was going to do a better job. John says, this is who I am. This is who I am. I was here to get you ready, to get your hearts fired up, to call you to repentance, to realize that you needed a Savior. That's why I'm here. He has come to set you free. And seeing that he's here, it means all of this hard work I've been putting in, everything I've been investing in you, all this preaching that I've been doing because that's the call God laid on my life, all of it is about to re be realized in its fullness. I'm about to see the fruit of everything I've worked for and my, I couldn't be happier. He becomes more, I become less. And notice it's the identity of Jesus that's on John's mind here. Because he continues to say, the one who comes from above is above all. 
The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. Who is John talking about when he talks about being from the earth? Himself. I am the one from the earth. And God has gifted me. He's filled me with his spirit. I've been, I've been ministering to you guys, and I am so grateful I have a part in God's plan, but I can only give you what I have received myself. Who I am is not enough, John says. He says, the one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. Do you hear what John is saying about Jesus? If you want to know God and the fullness of his truth, Jesus is who you need to accept. This one who is now supposedly, in your minds, my rival, he is the one who has what you need. John, instead of insulating and isolating and, and protecting his own ministry, says, good, go listen to him. Verse 34, the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. There is, do you hear how direct that is? Because of who Jesus is, when you hear him, you are hearing the words of God. For God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. And then one of the most striking verses of all Scripture, and the one we need to hear this morning, whoever believes in the Son has eternal. Does that sound familiar to you, by the way? It should sound very familiar to you. Because just before this, remember I talked about that man, Nicodemus, who had a conversation with Jesus? What did Jesus say to him? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. Do you hear how the author of this gospel is building a case for what you need and what I need? Do you hear how he's trying to help us understand this is who Jesus is? For John the Apostle, getting Jesus right is the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that matters. And in case you don't get that yet, listen to the follow-up to that statement. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. For God's wrath remains on them. I said to you that as a church, we must be Christ-centered. That is one of the most definitively biblical statements I could make. You are not a church if Christ is not your center. I would go that far to say. Let's look at how John builds this idea. So let me look. I've got a couple passages from the Gospel of John, and then I'm going to take us to 1 John 5. Because it wasn't enough for John to write in his Gospel. He had to add it one more time. Actually, a few more times, but we're going to look at it one more time. So let me read for you. We've already read John 3, 22 to 36. What if I read to you from John 12? John chapter 12, if we go to verses 37 and 50, it's a bit of a longer passage. But Jesus, whose ministry has now sort of made it into full swing. We see him speaking to the crowds. We see him speaking at the festivals. We see Jesus preaching the good news that he has come to set captives free, to heal the brokenhearted, to seek and to save the lost. How we respond to Jesus matters, and John has been making this case. And so when John chapter 12, beginning in verse 37, it says, after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe, because as Isaiah says somewhere, or elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts, so they can neither see with their hearts, sorry, sorry see with their eyes or understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Isn't that an interesting statement? Can I just pause on that really quickly? I said that Jesus is at the center, didn't I? That's the... By the way, if you haven't heard that yet, let me say it again. Jesus is in the middle. He's in the center. He's the thing we need. Isaiah was described as having seen Jesus' glory. All of this Old Testament 
material that they knew. All of this history God had given to his people as a grace gift. It was all about the glory of Jesus. And Isaiah saw that glory, and so he spoke and wrote. That's what John is pointing at. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him, that's Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise from men more than praise from God. That's a warning verse, by the way. Then Jesus cried out, when a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. As the person who hears my words, but does, as for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his command leads where? To eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Once again, as we see the book of John coming, the, the question, the critical question is, will you receive and believe in Jesus? Everything hangs on it. Everything hangs on it. John 15, which we're going to touch on again in a few weeks, and which many of you are very familiar with, is Jesus uses the metaphor of the vine and the branches. John chapter 15, verses 4 to 8 say this, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such a branch is picked up thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. If we are to be a fruitful church, where do we need to stay? Where do we need to remain? The verse is clear, right? What can we as a church accomplish apart from Jesus? Nothing. Or at least nothing of... I'm sure we could fill chairs. If we had a sweepstakes this morning for $10,000 and all you had to do was come to the church, we could fill chairs. We'd have to... Someone else would have to provide the $10,000. I couldn't do that. But we could fill seats, which would be empty the next week because all we gave them was $10,000. Think about this. Just think about that statement. All we gave them was $10,000. And if you want to know how empty that is, go look up. Just go online and search tragic lottery winners. Do you know how often winning the lottery means the end of your happiness? Because you spend the rest of your life fighting with relatives, or you spend all the money, and when the money's gone, you've got nothing left to hold? Apart from Christ, we can do nothing One more. Remember I said John was building a case that Jesus, the center of Jesus is all that matters. Getting him right is all that matters. John actually tells us the reason he wrote the book. In John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, it says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written. Now why? Why did John write? Isn't that important? Knowing why he wrote... In fact, I would recommend to you, if you were reading John for the first time, and you got to this verse and said, this is why I'm writing for you, go back and reread the book with that in your mind. So you can see how every word, every verse is taking you to John's conclusion. Why did he write the book? These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John says, the, 
the number one priority that I had as an author. The thing that God laid on my heart, the thing that his spirit enabled me to write by his grace. The purpose of all of these words is a singular person, Jesus. And if you find him, you find life. And as we already heard John the Baptist say, and if you do not find him, you cannot know life. That is why we must be Christ-centered. Um, have you ever watched? Have you ever watched athletes at the top of their game? Like, do you ever? I'm not a big track and field guy, but it is truly amazing. Have you ever watched someone do triple jump? If you, don't, if you think that's easy, I mean, they're just jumping into a sandpit. We can go outside, and I can watch you try and do hop, skip, jump, and then do it well. And then maybe what we'll do is we'll get a tape measure out, and we'll see what the world record is and see how close you came to your hop, skip, and jump. There are times where remarkable athletes show athleticism with a delicacy and precision that is just awe-inspiring. Do you know what I mean by that? Have you ever watched Connor McDavid play hockey? He makes, he makes professional hockey players look like little tyke or novice guy, kids skating around the ice. So let's compare. Have you ever watched a novice hockey game or a tyke hockey game? It's like a mob of insects chasing the puck. There's no structure. There's no, you know, if they get the puck off the ice for a shot, that is a truly remarkable event in the game. Connor McDavid makes other professional hockey players look like that. There's one goal, I think he was playing the New York Rangers, and you could just see in his mind, he's like, I think we need to score now. And he skates around all five of the other players on the ice and scores a goal. It's a remark. He, just the finesse, the, the understanding, the beauty of his movement, it's, it's awe-inspiring. There are other players who are just big and strong and will make playing the game a misery to you. They can win not by finesse, but by brutality and force. There are times where sermons are more like Connor McDavid. This morning, this morning, you're getting the brute, okay? I want to read to you just a few quotes. And I say a few, it's a lot. I want us to leave this morning, not only having heard the gospel speak, which, by the way, is the only thing that really matters. If, if all you can remember is what John has said, that's fantastic. But not only are we going to hear from John, not only am I going to show you a little diagram, a graphic that says we need to be Christ-centered, I want, to hear you, I want you to hear the voices from Christian history that have repeated over and over and over again. I want to batter it into you so that when you wake up tomorrow morning, you have been dreaming about the heroes of the Christian church talking about Jesus. That's all you dreamt about. That's, that's the force I want to apply to this message this morning, okay? So let me begin with Augustine of Hippo. Some of you probably know him as St. Augustine. And there's a couple quotes I could have chosen from him. But listen to what he says. And he's talking sort of to Christ or to, to God here. He loves thee too little who loves anything together with thee, which he does not love for thy sake. Do you hear what he's saying there? If you have Jesus and something... You don't love Jesus enough. It's not that you can't love your and something. It's just that we love Jesus and those things we receive, those good things, we recognize that we receive them through him by the grace of God. He loves thee too little who loves anything together with thee which he does not love for thy sake. Tim Keller says, as many have learned and later taught, you don't realize Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. But you hear the, the heart of that? Jesus is what you need. And sometimes God strips everything else away so you realize it. Blaise Pascal. Not only do we not know God except through Jesus Christ, we do not even know ourselves except through Jesus Christ. That's a really important statement. Jesus is not one of many ways to approach God, nor is he the best of several ways. He is the only way, A.W. Tozer. Carl Barth. By the way, I should mention, these, these, these quotes I'm giving you are from a diverse range of Christian backgrounds, okay? So, for example, Carl Barth and I, if we sat down and talked about God, we would have a lot of things we didn't, disagree, didn't agree about. He would probably win the argument just because he's way smarter than I am. But we, we would still not agree on everything. 
But one of the things we do agree on happens to be this quote. Jesus does not give recipes that show the way to God as other teachers of religion do. He himself is the way. John Knox said, no one else holds or has held in the place of the heart of the world which Jesus holds. Other gods have been devoutly worshipped. No other man has so been so devoutly loved. As a rule I have had for years is to treat the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal friend. He is not a creed or a mere doctrine, but it is he himself we have. That was Dwight Moody. B.B. Warfield writes, oh, I forgot to change the quote there. So that last quote may have been Moody or may have been Warfield and I may have made a mistake. Sorry about that. (laughs) I was dealing with a lot of quotes. We are told, C.S. Lewis, we are told that Christ was killed for us, that his dying has washed away our sins, and that by dying he disabled death itself. That is the formula. That is Christianity. That That is what we has to be believed. Christianity means community through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. No Christian community is more or less than that. That's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Another Bonhoeffer quote here, a longer one. I wanted to read the whole of it because I think it's very helpful. It is not in our life that God's help and presence must still be proved, but rather God's presence and help have been demonstrated for us in the life of Jesus Christ. Do you hear what he's saying there? He's saying, God... If you want me to believe in you, show me in my life your love for me. Bonhoeffer says, hold on. He has already demonstrated this for us. And in fact, if we start to ask the question, God, you need to prove it to me, we're already dislocating or mislocating the significance of God's work. It is, in fact, more important for us to know what God did to Israel and to his son Jesus than for us to see what God intends for us today. The fact that Jesus Christ died is more important than the fact that I shall die. And the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead is the sole ground of my hope that I now that I too shall be raised on the last day. I find no salvation in my life history, but only in the history of Jesus Christ. Only he who allows himself to be found in Jesus in his incarnation, in his cross, in his resurrection is with God and God is with him. Do you begin to see why we fear so much oftentimes? Why we're wondering what the future holds? Because our eyes are on us where we are right now. They're not on Christ and who he is and what he's done. If Christ has been given us, if we are called to his discipleship, we are given all things, literally all things. C.H. Spurgeon, I'll end with a whole bunch of Spurgeon quotes. I could have made all of these, by the way, Spurgeon quotes, because he just loves to talk about Jesus. This is going to come through. Whatever subject I preach, listen to this statement. Whatever subject I preach, I do not stop until I reach the Savior, the Lord Jesus. For in him are all things. Spurgeon, preach Christ or nothing. I don't dispute or dis- uh, I, I don't dispute or discuss except with Sorry, don't dispute or discuss, except with your eye on the cross. If driven off for a moment, always be on the watch to get back to your soul topic. There's some advice for preachers. Morality may keep you out of jail, but it takes the blood of Jesus Christ to keep you out of hell. What a great statement that is. Good manners won't save you. Godly men exercise faith in God, in their calling by trying to manifest a Christian spirit in all that they do. The spirit which actuates us may seem to be a small matter so long as we are outwardly right. So here he's saying there, he's saying, as long as it looks good on the outside, we, seem, we feel like we're doing the right thing, right? The spirit that actuates us, the spirit that drives us or, uh, or moves us, may seem to be a small matter so long as we are outwardly right. But it is in reality the essence of the whole thing. Take away the flavor from the fruit or the fragrance from the flower and what is left. left. Such is correct living without the, savior of, uh, sorry, the savor of grace. Oh, to act in your trade and your calling as Christ would have you, act, or as Christ would have acted. Had he been in your place? Hang that question up in your houses. What would Jesus do? And then think of another. How would Jesus do it? 
for what he would do and how he would do it may always stand as the best guide for us. Let this be your mark of true gospel preaching, where Christ is everything and the creature is nothing, where it is salvation and all of grace through the work of the Holy Spirit applying to the soul the precious blood of Jesus. Try to get a clear view of the gospel, and many a doubt and fear will fly away when the knowledge takes its place of ignorance. And I think I'm going to end with this quote here. Listen to what he says. I've quoted this one for you before. My hope lives not because I am a sinner, but because I am a sinner for whom Christ died. My trust is not that I am holy, but that being unholy, he is my righteousness. My faith rests not upon what I am or what I shall be or what I feel or know, but in what Christ is in what he has done, and what he is now doing for me. On the lion of justice, the fair maid of hope rides like a queen. What an amazing, did you hear that word picture? On the lion of justice, our fair maid of hope rides like a queen. Jesus, Jesus must be our center. Because as John said in 1 John 5, 12. Whoever has the Son has life. And whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Let me finish very quickly with four implications as we talk about all of this. Four things. First, the singular thing we as a church have that is worth sharing with others is Jesus. If we do not have him, we have no reason to exist. That is my premise. The only thing we have that's worth sharing with our world is Christ himself. Because whoever has the Son has life. But if you do not have the Son, nothing else matters. Jesus should define us. And if he does not, we have lost our way. The second thing, if Jesus really is our all in all, we have no right or mandate to direct the church apart from his teaching and obedience to his word. That's called discipleship, right? What does Jesus say? You need to take up your cross daily and fill it in the sentence. Follow me. Now, if you're playing follow the leader... Who do you follow? Who who leads the way? I've already, the the name gives it away, doesn't it? If we're playing follow the leader, you don't decide what the leader's doing is dumb, I'm going to do my own thing. Because you know what you stop doing then? Playing follow the leader. And that's a children's game, but what we're talking about is actually of eternal and ultimate significance. Following Jesus means you follow him. And as a church, we don't have a mandate. We don't have permission to do our own thing. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to follow him. We are to listen to him. We are to apply his teachings. We are to obey his teachings, even when it's costly. We are to follow him. By the way, as we talk about the Holy Spirit in a few weeks, we're going to find out this is the primary reason God sends His Spirit to be in us. What is Jesus? We're going to see in Jesus, in John, actually in John 14, 15, and 16. We're going to see that what the Spirit of God does, the Holy Spirit does, is He comes into our lives and He speaks to us what Jesus has said and opens up to us what Jesus has said. And He reveals the truth of Jesus to us so that we can do and be what we ought to be by God's grace. And many a church has lost its way because they stopped following him and started doing what they felt was right or smart or wise or ingenious. We have in Canada, and I won't, I, my, my intent here is not to tear down anyone else. That's not the point. But it's a, hist- it's a lesson from history we need to learn. There is in Canada more than one denomination that have 
looked at what Jesus said to us and said, people don't really want to buy this product. And so have broadened their perspective and broadened their horizons. And there's one denomination in particular, I wrote, read a history paper written on it, as, as a Canadian scholar was looking at the history of this church and its decline, they pinpointed, and this was not someone who was an evangelical saying, look, the evangelical church is right and everybody else is wrong. That wasn't the point of the paper. The point of the paper was to say, at what point do we see a significant decline in the history of this church? And was there anything we can tie to that decline? And you know what they found? As soon as you stop telling people you have to go to church if you want to find salvation. As soon as you stop telling people that Jesus is the center and you have to come to him and he calls us as a body to gather together and worship together. As soon as they said you can find truth and meaning in places other than Jesus and his body. As soon as they said that, people stopped coming to church. Because they told him, you don't have to come here. You don't have to come to him to find hope and healing and life. You can go out and sit in a wood and just sit quietly listening to the birds. Remember that quote we had? You love Jesus too little if you love him plus something else? What we need to do is come listen to the word and then go listen to the birds. Because he shows us this is the beauty of creation. This is the beauty of your life. This is the beauty of your job. This is the beauty of your relationship. These are the dangers that surround all those things. If we have not heard Christ and we are not following him, we've lost our way. That's a simple truth. Thirdly, the message of the church is primarily positive. What should our message be to the world outside? Given that we just saw Jesus at the center, and if you have him, you have life, and if you don't have him, you don't have life. What should our primary message be? I don't think it's that complicated. I think our message should be, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. There is a negative side to that, isn't that? Isn't there? Do you remember when Jesus called some of his first disciples and they were in their boats? What did, what did Jesus say to them? Leave your nets, leave your boats, leave your father, come follow me. You and I coming to Jesus will mean leaving things behind. It will. Absolutely. Absolutely it will. But the primary message is come to him. Because that stuff you're going to leave behind, he's better. In fact... If you hold on to those things and don't reach hold of him, what you'll find in the end is all you hold is emptiness and ultimately death. Because the one who has the Son has life. And the one who does not have the Son does not have life. We are all sinners deserving condemnation. But praise God, I am a sinner saved by grace. And there are tragic consequences to those who love other than Jesus. Our message needs to be come to him. By the way, I'm not saying that like it's a message for someone else. I'm saying that it's a message for you and for me. That's why we show up on Sunday morning because we're hearing the call, come to me. And finally, our highest priority, our highest priority as followers of Jesus, must be to know the truth and to know him. We have to. We have to commit ourselves to knowing him. Every day should be a pursuit of that. And I think this is going to have consequences you don't expect. Have you ever been tired of your job? Have you ever been tired of doing things for the church? I'm sure none of our volunteers have ever wished to step back from any of their volunteer opportunities. You've never woken up in the morning and thought, oh, I promised I would do this. I promised I'd clean the church. I promised I'd do, you know, meet with this individual. I'm sure none of us have ever grown weary while doing good. Do you know what the solution for that is? Do you know what the solution to when following Christ becomes burdensome and exhausting? It's not to try harder. It's not to decide that you can do it. Positive self-talk is not the gospel message. 
The solution is to draw close to him. What did Jesus say? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he then goes on to talk about how his burden is light, his yoke is easy. Does that mean he doesn't ever give you something difficult to tackle? No. That's not the point. The point is when the grace and love of God compels us, the grace and love of God that we find in Jesus drives us. It's no longer burdensome. It's no longer wearying. It's no longer exhausting. By grace, we find joy in it. So if you're feeling tired this morning, I urge you to come to him. It is entirely possible that you feel a deep longing this morning, an ache for something that will satisfy your soul and give you purpose and meaning in your days. If the Bible is true, and I'm going to argue today that it is, in fact, not only is it true, it is the truth. We find <coughs> truth in Christ, of whom Scripture speaks. If what I'm saying this morning is true, you will never find what you're looking for apart from Jesus. Never. Every good thing, every good thing that you long for, every good thing that you were meant to have, it will only find its proper place in light of who he is. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have.